Number three, William Bresnahan Jr. William Bresnahan Sr. was a physician and he lived in Broomfield, Colorado. He was married to a woman named Laurel and they had four children together. On August 3, 1964, the couple, who were both 39, were camping with their four children near Silverthorne, Colorado. The next morning, two surveyors in the area happened upon a disturbing scene. William Sr. had been brutally murdered, Laurel was missing, and three of the four children were locked in the family's camper. The children were all unharmed. The couple's eldest son, 16-year-old William Jr., said that his parents were attacked by a man with kinky hair. He said that his mother's body was at the bottom of a nearby ravine. The bodies were sent to the medical examiner, and he concluded that William Sr. and Laurel had died brutal deaths. Both had been stabbed several times, and they had been bludgeoned with a blunt instrument that was similar to a baseball bat. The police looked for a man with kinky hair who had been in the area that night, but their search turned up nothing. The police soon suspected that William Jr. may have been the killer. He had cuts on his hands that could have been caused by stabbing his parents. William Jr. was interviewed by the police and he eventually confessed. He said that he never really liked his mother. He didn't really explain why he didn't like his mother, he just said it was a bunch of small things. On the evening of August 3rd, while they were camping, William Jr. said that he tried to talk to his mother about buying him a car, but she refused to listen to him. This made him angry, so he found a knife and started stabbing his mother. She kept screaming, so William Jr. picked up a tree branch and beat her until she stopped screaming. He then picked up his knife and stabbed her some more. Once she was dead, he dragged her body to the edge of the ravine and rolled it down. He then found his father, who was relaxing near their campsite. William Jr. told his father that he had killed his mother. He said that his father got angry and charged at him. William Jr. ran and his father chased him. Then his father tripped and William Jr. pounced on him. He stabbed him several times and then left him to bleed to death. But William Sr. didn't die from the stab wounds and he managed to drag himself for about a mile looking for help. And William Jr. discovered that his father wasn't where he left him. William Jr. followed the trail of blood, and when he found his father, he picked up a tree branch that was about the size of a baseball bat and used it to beat his father to death. At his trial, William Jr. planned on pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. He was examined by three doctors who said he was disturbed but sane at the time of the murders. The doctors also said that it was possible that William Jr. was abused by his parents. Instead of pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, in November 1964, William Jr. pleaded guilty to two counts of first degree murder. In January 1965, William Jr., who was 17, was sentenced to two concurrent life sentences. After he was sentenced, he was placed in the Colorado State Penitentiary. Nine months later, he was caught trying to escape the prison. Using a hacksaw, he cut the bars of his cell's window and he got outside the prison walls. He had made his own wetsuit and he got into a creek that was on the prison grounds. The creek had underwater bars in it, and he set to work cutting those with a hacksaw. That was when he was caught, and he was ordered to stop. After the escape attempt, William Jr. started to focus his attention on his education. He took courses from the University of Southern Colorado, 
and four years later, he graduated. He had a perfect 4.0 average, and that made him top of his class. After he graduated, his case was brought to the attention of Governor Richard Lamb. Lamb commuted William Jr.'s sentence from life to 26 years and 10 months. Two years later, in 1977, William Jr. was paroled after serving 12 years in prison. When he was paroled, he moved in with his defense lawyer and his family. While William Jr. was on parole, he attended medical school at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. He finished medical school and he became licensed to practice medicine in both Colorado and California. When he was in prison, William Jr. said that the Hispanic inmates protected him. So after he became a doctor, he moved to California where he treated non-English speaking migrant workers. In 1987, William Jr. was granted an unconditional pardon by Governor Roy Romer. William Bresnahan Jr. still practices medicine and he lives in California. We're just going to take a quick break from our video to bring you a word from our sponsor, which is one of my favorite mobile games, Vikings War of Clans. Vikings is an addictive RPG strategy game that reminds me of some of my favorite games from the 1990s like Command & Conquer and Civilization. The game is constantly evolving because Vikings has over 20 million online users who fight over resources, make new alliances, and even compete in live events. This month, Vikings is having a contest where you can win one of four drones. You can find all the information about the contest by following the link in the description box. Support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links in the description box and get the special bonus of 200 gold and a protective shield. Also, please don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under my nickname, Criminally Listed. And now, back to our video. Number 2. Jennifer and David Bailey In early March 1988, Susan and Richard Bailey eloped. Richard was in the Air Force, so the young couple moved around a lot. In 1990, Susan gave birth to a daughter named Jennifer. Four years later, the family grew with the birth of a son named David. The Bailey family eventually ended up settling in Roanoke, Texas. Over a decade after David was born, Susan and Richard got divorced, and Susan was given custody of the children. When Jennifer and David were in their teens, Susan struggled to financially support the family. She had several part-time jobs, and this kept her away from home quite a bit. When Jennifer was a teen, and David was a preteen, they began to show behavioral problems. Jennifer was known to steal from people, while David rarely did his homework, he got into fights at school, and he was known to cut himself. When Jennifer was 17 years old, she started to date 16-year-old Paul Henson, who attended the same high school as her. Paul was known around school for his odd behavior. He had violent mood swings, and he told people that he had a split personality. Susan did not like her daughter's boyfriend. She thought Paul was weird, and Jennifer's grades began to slip after they started dating. Shortly after they started dating, Paul befriended a 14-year-old girl who attended their high school. The 14-year-old girl wasn't identified in the media, but in Donna Fielder's book about the case, she calls the girl Mary Lee. So for the sake of simplicity, she'll be referred to as Mary Lee for the rest of this video. Paul explained to both Jennifer and Mary Lee that he had two different personalities. He then explained that one personality was in love with Jennifer, and the other was in love with Mary Lee. Both Mary Lee and Jennifer accepted this, and Paul started dating both girls. Shortly afterward, he got Jennifer and Mary Lee to hang out together, and eventually, they all started a three-way sexual relationship. Just like Susan Bailey, Mary Lee's mother did not like Paul, 
and she did not approve of Mary Lee hanging out with him. In the summer of 2008, tension in the Bailey household had escalated. Susan and Jennifer were constantly fighting about Paul. Eventually, Susan banned Jennifer from seeing him. In the spring, Jennifer had graduated from high school and she was set to start art school in Dallas in October. Jennifer wanted to move into an apartment in Dallas, but Susan couldn't afford to pay for an apartment for her. Instead, Susan planned to buy a newer car, and then she would let Jennifer use her old car. Jennifer hated that idea. She didn't want the old car, and she thought she was entitled to drive the newer car. But then it turned out that Susan couldn't afford a second car. So Susan suggested that Jennifer should take the train to school every day. Jennifer hated this idea as well. Around the same time that the mother and daughter were arguing about transportation, David was acting out more than usual. One day while Susan was at work, she received a call from the police. Her neighbors had called the police because David, who was 14 years old, had been running around the backyard naked. In September 2008, unbeknownst to Susan, Paul and Mary Lee were spending most of their time at her home with Jennifer. When Susan was at work, which was a lot of the time, Paul and Mary Lee hung out in the open. When Susan was home, they either hid somewhere in the house or hid in the park across the road. Little did Susan know, but the teens were hatching a plan. On September 23, 2008, Mary Lee's mother awoke to find her daughter standing over her. Mary Lee was holding a large butcher knife. Her mother backed away from her quickly and she grabbed a phone. She called 911 and yelled at Mary Lee to drop the knife. Mary Lee cried and demanded her mother's cell phone and the keys to her car. The police arrived minutes later and they took Mary Lee to a juvenile detention center. The next day, Paul's dad reported him as a runaway. He also said that Paul had stolen his 22 caliber Ruger pistol. Paul had made threats against his high school, and the police were worried that he was going to shoot up the school. The morning after Paul was reported missing, the police went to the Bailey's house and found evidence that Paul had been there, but Paul wasn't in the home, so the police left. At the time, that wasn't the only problem the Baileys were dealing with. The day before, David had been suspended from school for bringing a knife to school. Not long after the police searched her home for Paul, Susan went to work her shift at a dress shop and then she went to her second job at Bed Bath & Beyond. She returned home around midnight, exhausted. She walked upstairs and she was ambushed. 16-year-old Paul came up from behind her and put a cloth with a chemical over her mouth. Susan then saw her two children, who were wearing handkerchiefs over the lower parts of their faces, move towards her. 17-year-old Jennifer and 14-year-old David then started stabbing their mother in the chest. Then, from behind, Paul slit Susan's throat twice. Susan fell to the floor and someone started stabbing her in the back of the head to make sure she was dead. Then Jennifer, David, and Paul got into Susan's car and started driving. Three days later, the trio were arrested in Yankton, South Dakota. The city has a curfew for youths, and the teens were found at a closed gas station at around 3.30 a.m. The officer who found them talked to Jennifer and she kept changing her story. The officer had a bad feeling about the trio, so he got in contact with the police in Roanoke. Two days earlier, Susan's mother had called the Roanoke police because she couldn't get a hold of her daughter or her grandchildren. Officers went to the Bailey's house and they found 43-year-old Susan's dead body lying face down at the top of the stairs. 
Inside the house, the police found an overwhelming amount of evidence that Jennifer, David, and Paul were the ones who killed Susan. The original plan was that Mary Lee, Paul, and Jennifer were all going to kill their parents and then run away to Canada. Jennifer told David about the plan and he was excited by it. David said it was just like in the movies. Before the murder, David rode his bike to a local store and he bought a cleaning solution that the kids used to try and clean up the crime scene. But they did a terrible job of cleaning up. Notably, Paul cut his hair and he left the hair in the bathroom. Jennifer and David left behind the handkerchiefs that they wore during the murder and the police were able to get their DNA off the handkerchiefs. The police found weapons hidden in other rooms and chocolate pudding in the refrigerator that had been poisoned. The police realized that the kids had set up multiple rooms so that they could have killed Susan in any room she might have walked into. An autopsy revealed that Susan had 26 wounds. The medical examiner said that it looked like she had been stabbed by three different people. After the teens were arrested in South Dakota, officers from Roanoke were sent to pick them up. Jennifer was put into one car and Paul and David were put into another. During a pit stop, the boys were left alone in the car and little did they know but they were being recorded. David talked and laughed about how his mother urinated when they killed her. And Paul mocked Susan, saying she looked like an ape. The police asked Jennifer about her relationship with her mother, and she said that they didn't see eye to eye. In December 2008, Jennifer and Paul were indicted for capital murder, and David was labeled a young offender which in Texas is called a child in need of supervision. Since they were under 18 when they committed the murder, none of them were eligible for the death penalty. But Jennifer and Paul could have been sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole, and David could have been sentenced to up to 40 years in prison. Mary Lee agreed to a plea deal, and she pleaded guilty to aggravated assault. She was sentenced to five years probation. In June 2009, Paul took a plea deal and he was sentenced to 60 years in prison. He'll be able to apply for parole in September 2038 at the age of 57. He confessed to taking part in Susan's murder. He said that he, Jennifer and David swarmed Susan once she got to the top of the stairs. Jennifer also took a plea deal and she received a sentence of 60 years of prison. She claimed that Paul went nuts and killed her mother while she begged him to stop. She said that David wasn't involved in the murder at all. The physical evidence lines up with Paul's version of events. Finally, David also took a plea deal and he was given a 26 year sentence. He'll be able to apply for parole in 2021. Number 1. Sean Sellers Sean Sellers was born in May 1968 in California. His mother, Bonda, was just 16 years old when she gave birth to him. When Sean was a toddler, his father left him and his mother. When Sean was five, his mother married Leo Bellafado, who was a trucker. Leo was the main father figure in Sean's life, and Sean called him dad. Bonda would often join Leo on his long hauls, and Sean would be left with different family members. Sean later claimed that his mother, grandfather, and an uncle all abused him. Throughout his childhood and his early teens, his mother and stepfather moved around constantly. Sean moved with them each time. Because of the constant moving, Sean never stayed in one school for very long and he found it difficult to make friends. When Sean was 15, his family was living in Greeley, Colorado 
and he was happy there. He was a member of the Civil Air Patrol and he was doing well in school. But then came the news that they were moving to a different state yet again. Since the age of five, Sean had moved 30 times. This time they were moving to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. In Oklahoma City, Sean developed an interest in Satanism. Two aspects of Satanism were incredibly appealing to Sean. It promised freedom and control over his life. In his chaotic life, power and control were what the 15-year-old wanted most. Sean read the Satanic Bible several times, he performed Satanic rituals, and he even drank his own blood. He became friends with other people who were interested in Satanism, and they would drink each other's blood. One of these friends was Richard Howard, who was a year older than him. Sean and Richard talked to each other about dark fantasies that they had. Many times, Sean said that he wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. Then on September 8, 1985, Sean and Richard decided that would be the night Sean killed someone. Originally, they planned on killing Richard's girlfriend's father, but then they changed their minds. Instead, they decided to kill Robert Paul Bauer, a 35-year-old man who worked the midnight shift at a nearby convenience store. Sean didn't know Bauer, but Richard did. In fact, he was mad at Bauer because he tried to buy beer from the store a week earlier, and Bauer denied him because he was underage. Sean and Richard grabbed a 357 Magnum and a 44 caliber rifle from Richard's house then they performed a satanic ritual in the yard. They drove to the store where Bauer was working, and they hung around inside the store for a while. They asked Bauer about the store's security and if there were any cameras. Bauer, not realizing that the two teens were planning to kill him, answered their questions honestly. He told them there were no cameras in the store, and there was only $50 in the cash register, and he didn't think that anyone would hurt or kill him to get to the $50. After about an hour, Richard convinced Bauer to come out to his car to check out his clutch pedal. He had just installed it, and Bauer wanted to put a new clutch pedal into his own car. Sean followed them out to the car. As Richard and Bauer walked back to the store, Sean grabbed the Magnum out of the car and then started to walk behind them. When they got back inside the store, Bauer went behind the counter. Sean raised the gun, and Bauer saw the gun pointed at his head. Sean fired, and he missed. Bauer ran and Sean chased him, and then suddenly, Bauer tripped. Sean shot at him again, and this time Bauer was hit, but he wasn't killed. Bauer then got behind the counter. Sean saw the scared look in Bauer's eyes as he stuck his head above the counter. Sean pointed the magnum at his head and pulled the trigger a third time. It was a kill shot. 35-year-old Robert Paul Bauer died on the floor a few minutes later. The two teenage boys got into Richard's car and they drove away. As they drove to Richard's house, they laughed because they felt giddy. Once they got back to Richard's house, they put the guns back where they found them. Six months later, the investigation into Bauer's murder remained cold. Sean didn't keep it a secret that he was the killer. He bragged about committing the murder to several friends and co-workers. Unfortunately, none of them went to the police. Shortly after the murder, Sean started dating a 15-year-old high school dropout named Angel. Sean's mother, Fonda, hated Angel and she did not want Sean to see her. Sean thought his mother didn't like Angel because she reminded her of herself when she was 15. When Fonda was 15, she became pregnant with Sean. 
The fighting between mother and son got worse, and it even got physical at one point. Then on March 4th, 1986, about six months after the murder of Bauer, 16-year-old Sean decided that his mother and stepfather had to die. While they were awake and in a different room, he went into their bedroom and grabbed a 44 caliber pistol out of his stepfather's dresser. That evening, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Sean's stepfather, Leo, had talked to Sean about rebuilding the engine of Sean's pickup truck. After 32-year-old Vonda and 43-year-old Leo went to bed, Sean supposedly performed a satanic ritual in his bedroom. Then he went into his parents' bedroom, only wearing black underwear. He shot both of them once in the back of the head. He said that after he killed his mother and stepfather, he felt relieved. After shooting his parents, he had made it look like there had been a break-in. He then went to his friend Richard's house and told him what happened. Richard hid the gun for him and let him spend the rest of the night. The next morning, Sean went home and called the police. He told them there had been a break-in and his parents were dead. Two days later, Sean was interviewed by the police and after talking to him, he was arrested for his parents' murder. Richard Howard was also arrested and he led the police to the gun that killed Robert Bauer. Sean was charged with his murder as well. Richard was originally charged with first degree murder, but those charges were dismissed. He agreed to testify against Sean in exchange for five years deferred for his roles in the murders. In September 1986, Sean went to trial for the three murders. Sean's lawyer argued that he was not guilty because he had been brainwashed by Satanism and the occult and he was addicted to Dungeons and Dragons and couldn't tell the difference between real life and make-believe. Sean didn't testify, but his lawyer said that he had no recollection of the murders. Sean was ultimately convicted of all three murders. Sean was 16 years old when he committed the murders and he was 17 when he was convicted. Despite being a juvenile, Sean was sentenced to death. After Sean was sentenced to death, he did interviews with People Magazine and Oprah Winfrey, and in the interviews, he said he remembered the murders. He said that when he killed Bauer, his mother and stepfather, he wasn't himself. He said he was possessed by a demon named Ezeret, and Ezeret was responsible for the murders. After a few years on death row, Sean started a website that had journal entries about his day-to-day -day life on death row. He also posted a complete confession of his crimes. While he was on death row, Sean became a Christian. He also appealed his death sentence, saying he wasn't responsible for the murders because he suffered from multiple personality disorder. He claimed it was the other personality that performed the killings and not him but his appeals were denied. Anti-death penalty advocates fought to get Sean off death row. They argue that since he was 16 years old when he committed the three murders, he did not understand the full consequences of his actions. They also said that his transformation from a Satanist to a Christian showed that he was worthy of mercy. However, many people weren't convinced that Sean's conversion to Christianity was legitimate. They thought he found religion just to save himself from being executed. Sean eventually asked for clemency from the governor. On February 2nd, 1999, the governor denied his request. On February 5th, 1999, at 12.17 a.m., Sean Sellers was pronounced dead. He was 29 years old. His last words before he was executed via lethal injection were lyrics from a Christian song. They were, Set my spirit free that I may praise thee. Set my spirit free that I might worship thee. 
Since 1976, there have been 22 people who have been executed for crimes that they committed when they were under the age of 18. Sean Sellers was one of those people. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. Well, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching.